you, my sicko commander in chief, Michael Moore. Uh, well, <laughs> thank you, and I, I always love coming to Denver. Uh, it's uh, an important role in my, in my life, and uh, I do appreciate everybody uh, being here. Uh, for this uh, very important cause um, uh, on a day where another important cause was being celebrated. Woo! Uh, Donna, thank you. Uh, when you see the movie, uh, you'll see Donna and her husband Larry uh, tell a very powerful story about how uh, hardworking people in this country um, end up bankrupt and homeless. Uh, because medical bills are now the number one cause of bankruptcy and homelessness uh, in America. Something seems odd about making a statement like that in the wealthiest country on earth. That's right. And, uh, and I thank Larry and Donna uh, for sharing their story with me and now with millions of people who will see what this very cruel economic system that we live under does to people who do nothing other than get up in the morning and work hard so that they can raise their families and end up with the crap being kicked out of them. So thank you, Donna, and thank you, Larry, for this. We have nine million children in this country that are uninsured. It's strange, isn't it, that we won't even say that the children, the children have a right to see a doctor when they get sick and not have to worry about paying for it. I really can't imagine what American wouldn't at least join us on that basic level. And yet, we have nine million children with no health insurance in this country. But this is part and parcel of a system that is set up to be cruel to those who are the have-nots. In other societies, in other countries, they think it's the worst thing to do is to let too many people slip between the cracks. Because if you let too many people slip between the cracks, the whole society suffers. So the Canadian way of doing this, or the British way, or the Irish way, the French way, the Swedish way, the Greek way, the Czech way, the Polish way, the El Salvadoran way, the Brazilian way, even in poorest Ghana, Ghana has just passed a universal health care act. In those countries, they operate with the concept, with the idea of we. And unfortunately, we come and live with the idea of me. That's the big difference between us and them. They see themselves all in the same boat and that they sink or swim together. The American way is pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Every man for himself. I got my problems, you got your problems. You take care of your problems, I'll take care of my problems. Me, 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 me. And we don't understand that as long as we continue to behave like that, this is what they used to call the, the pioneer spirit. This kind of mentality, it might have served us well, I guess, while we were committing a genocide of the native people of this country, or enslaving a whole group of people to help build the wealthiest economy that the world has ever seen. You know, if we hadn't had that, that early start with all that free labor, we'd still be struggling a bit. But we got a, we got a big boost up because we didn't have to pay people a certain skin color. So here we are now. And we're number 37 in the world in healthcare. 37. We follow Costa Rica. And we're just, we're just ahead of Slovenia. <laughs> um, the pharmaceutical companies and the health insurance companies 
have a vested interest in keeping us sick. That's the only way they can make money, is to not provide real care to us when we're ill. You know, 30 years ago, there were 25 pharmaceutical firms that were working on cures and vaccines. 25 of them. Today, there are five. Now, why is that? Because there's no money once you cure somebody. Once you cure somebody, they're not going to need your pills for the next 30 or 40 years. So, the idea is not to come up with a cure or a vaccine. The idea is to, how can we make sure they continue to be sick, we'll maintain them so that they can at least get up and go to work and produce things for us. But keep them on the pills until the day they die. It's a genius system, isn't it? I mean, really, it really is. But that's not the way it used to be. In the early part of the first half of the 20th century, there were people like Jonas Salk, who invented the polio vaccine and essentially eradicated polio. And they asked him, they said, aren't you going to patent this for yourself? Because you're the inventor of it. He said, no. <laughs> that would be immoral. He said, would you patent the sun? The sun belongs to everyone. This vaccine belongs to everyone. He wouldn't take anything for it. That's the way it used to be. That's the way it used to be. The man who invented the kidney dialysis machine wouldn't take anything for it. Wouldn't, wouldn't patent it. He said, this belongs to everyone. But that's not what we have now. Because greed, <laughs> greed rules the day. And these greedy bastards who run these companies, it's not just Halliburton in the war, there's the Halliburtons of the pharmaceutical companies, and the Halliburtons of the health insurance companies, and the Halliburtons of the hospital corporations. They're all Halliburtons. They're all in it for the money. And it's up to us to stop them. The, um, these companies have already begun their attacks on me and uh, the movie. Right. <laughs> I, no, no, but I've been through this once or twice before. I, I know what it feels like. I know what it feels like to say on the fifth day of the war that we're being led to war for fictitious reasons on the Oscar stage and then be booed off that stage. Uh, but as I was as I was carted away by security uh, that night. And by the way, where were you? Why weren't you in that building? <laughs> Next time you gotta come. Don't leave me out there alone. <laughs> as, they, as they took me away. Um, I thought to myself, I said, well, you know what? Most of the people I run into this country, they're good people. They do have a good heart. And they do have a conscience. And they do know right from wrong. They're just misinformed. They're, they go through an education system that at times seems destined just to keep them stupid. We pay, we pay so little attention and give so little money to the education of our own kids. It's just a and, and, and then once as adults, they're kept ignorant by a media that doesn't do its job. It doesn't ask the question. It doesn't give them the answers. And I have to say, I actually hold our mainstream media more responsible for this war. Of course.
confidence in the anger sleep. 3,500 plus dead soldiers. God knows how many dead Iraqis. None of that will make the evening news here in Denver tonight. All due respect. But thank God for the internet. Thank God for independent media and alternative media. Thank God for Amy Quickman. For all the people out there, all of you who talk to your friends and your neighbors and your co-workers and the students you go to school with and you share the truth with them. And by doing that, think about this, by doing that, you have circumvented the mainstream media. You circumvented the mainstream media. You took a country that was 80% in favor of the war to now 70% against the war. And yet you were able to get the word out in your daily lives. And that, that's the important thing to remember. The power of the individual to make change. One person does make a difference. We're told this from the time we're little, that you don't really count. You don't make a difference. You can't fight City Hall. Don't wreck the boat. I'm telling you, it starts with one person who talks to 10 people they talk to 10, and they talk to 10, and they talk to 10, and before you know it, he has a 26% approval rating. <laughs> now our good friends in the press are going, well, I thought he was coming here to talk about health care. How'd he get off on the war? <laughs> I'll tell you why they're connected. $100 billion a year on this war, and we're in the fifth year of this war? Don't ever tell me that we can't find the money again to do things like universal health care. Not a personal note. How's my knee? Uh, yeah, well, I have great insurance because I'm one of the 9% of the people in this country that are not government employees that belong to a union. And when you belong to a union, you have a pretty decent shot at getting pretty decent health coverage. But we're down to 9% now. That's really sad, isn't it? Um, but even with the health insurance, I'm glad you asked me this question because uh, I, I had to have my appendix out uh, a couple years ago. And um, they wheeled me into the operating room. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, it happens so quick. I don't know if you ever had an appendicitis attack or whatever, but there's literally no time to get your affairs in order. <laughs> and <laughs> so they wheeled me in and, uh, into the operating room, and the uh, anesthesiologist comes in and. Uh, I look up at him, and I don't know how this thought popped in my head, but I just said to him, I said, you know, there's people that would pay you a lot of money just to dial that thing up and not you too. <laughs> and he said to me, don't worry, I don't vote. <laughs> I said, no, you have to vote. <laughs> and then I blacked out. Uh, <laughs> Afterwards, the surgeon told me that just as he began the operation, he looked up on the wall of the uh, of the operating room, and there's a frame there's a framed photo there of George W. Bush. He said, "I had to ask the nurse to take it down because I couldn't have Bush watching me while I was cutting you open." Uh, but speaking of staying alive, while I was making this film, I thought, you know, it's a little hypocritical of myself making a healthcare documentary and not taking care of my own health. 
And at that moment, when that thought entered my thick skull, um, I, I said, you know, I really need to do something about this. And, uh, but because I'm a guy from the Midwest, and, you know, and actually, if you're from my part of the country, you know, I'm one of the skinny ones. Um, <laughs> but, uh, so, you know, you'll never get us to an aerobics or a spinning class or, a, uh, you know, dieting or whatever. But I did find that uh, just by doing a couple things, uh, going for a walk every day for a half hour to an hour and uh, eating these uh, things that uh, some of you call uh, fruits and the vegetables. <laughs> um, so I've, I've been able to drop 30 pounds. And, uh, <laughs> It's just like a pound a week, or you know, it's all. It's for so. If you're in my predicament, one way to fight the man, one way to avoid our broken healthcare system, is to take care of yourself. And, uh, you know, now that's not going to be true for everybody because certain things we can't avoid because of the environmental factors, the world we live in, the different things. Uh, you know, heredity. I mean, there's a whole bunch of causes as to why people get sick. But it's just, it's just, uh, it's just one thought that I. I, I thought I would share while I calmed down from the sight of the guy who was coming up here to pummel the shit out of me. <laughs> I guess we're supposed to do a press conference uh, here. Up here. Is that what we're doing, or are we? I, let me just close uh, uh, by saying that uh, I've, I've made a movie, uh, really uh, from my heart, and I um, uh, have tried to do some things in this film to reach out across. Uh, the divide that we have in this country. And I really want to say uh, to any Republicans who are listening, any conservatives, any recovering Republicans, uh, we have a big tent, you're welcome. Um, you know, we can have our political differences. We should be able to find some common ground on uh, issues like health care. Uh, I do want to invite uh, those who aren't necessarily on our side of the political fence to join with us on this particular issue. And I'm asking the candidates who are running for office in this coming election year to take a pledge, a pledge that involves these following four promises. Number one, I support free, universal health care for every resident of the United States for a lifetime. Number two, I support the elimination of the private insurance companies. There's no room for them. There's no room for profit. Number three, the pharmaceutical companies need to be strictly regulated as if they were a public utility. And number four, I want the candidates to swear that they will not take any campaign money from the pharmaceutical companies, from the health insurance companies, from the hospital corporations, and in fact, Let's get the money out of politics all together. I want to close with a, a story that's not in the movie, uh, an interview that we filmed with a man from Denver. Uh, he works in uh, one of the uh, HMOs uh, out here. And he's that person, uh, like many other people that work in cubicles every day taking phone calls from people around the country. And so many times, you know, doctors and hospitals have to call the HMO for permission. So someone sitting in a cubicle in Denver, maybe a thousand miles away from where this person is in the hospital in need of treatment, is making a decision. And this individual actually worked in uh, customer relations here at one of the insurance companies. And he told us the story of a woman who was raped and had to go to the hospital, submitted the bill to her health insurance company. She was covered, fully insured. And they refused to pay her bill because according to the fine print in her, con her health insurance policy, it doesn't cover you if you're a victim of a crime. It was the most amazing thing I'd, I had heard. It equaled another thing I had heard while making this film of a, of a woman <clears throat> who again had full, full coverage, even covered mental health, 
went to see her psychiatrist because she too was a rape victim years ago. The HMO wouldn't pay for the visit to the psychiatrist because they said the rape was a pre-existing condition. <laughs> this is the insanity that the average American is dealing with. I'm sure many of you have your own stories to tell of trying to deal with the healthcare uh, industry. In fact, we are inundated with stories right now that people have been sending us. It's amazing. And I have to say, the health insurance companies, the pharmaceutical companies, the hospital corporations, they've done an excellent job organizing the people of America against this greedy, profit-driven system. And I am very optimistic that we are going to have universal health care in our lifetime in this country. Thank you very much for being here.